Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog 2. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Snarky Personality encompassing Sega's episode of Name That Animal. Dr. Robotnik, while well, the conic and popular as the ball hedgehog is, Sonic is better than the Yeah, Sega CD didn't exactly bomb Sega. In America first, this was due to Western audiences. Sonic was never good. We're finishing this. Sonic the Hedgehog 3, the final game in the Sonic trilogy, while also being a follow-up to the third game, while being a direct sequel to the second. Did you get all that? Sir, please stop calling this number. I've talked extensively about the Sonic series, calling each game in the original trilogy such slurs as good, great, okay. But if there was any sort of confusion at all, I love the Sonic series. The fast-paced action, the essence of breezing through the game as fast as possible to some of the best music video games has to offer. As much as I love to bitch about the Sonic series, this series is truly one of the most fun and memorable experiences in all of video game history. And no classic Sonic game can define that better than 1994's Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Which is absolutely amazing. Especially because I still have never beaten this game in its entirety. Sonic 1, I have beaten about 15 times. Now, Sonic 2, on the other hand, I've gotten to the final boss at least 30 times, but I've only beaten it like twice. We're not gonna go back to bitching about that. Sonic CD, I beat three times when I took an extensive look at that earlier this year. But Sonic 3, I have only beaten the mainline story once, and that was a long time ago when I was an idiot or at least far less of an idiot. I don't know why I've never given this title the time of day. I mean, it's great, and every experience I've had with it has been amazing, but I've just never dissected it like I have the others. But that is going to change today, because I am finally gonna take a look at Sonic 3. I'm gonna play the game, have a wonderful time, and then I am never gonna talk about 2D Sonic ever again. This is Sonic 3, the last 2D title in Sonic's arsenal for home consoles. I don't think I need to explain that in 1993, Sonic was at the height of its popularity. Toys, TV shows, even a Macy's Thanksgiving Day balloon that unfortunately had some technical difficulties in its first appearance. It still looks better than Sonic Boom though. Sonic was the video game icon of the early 90s, but it was around Sonic 3's release that Sega got a little too friendly with the blue blur. Sonic games were coming out left and right. Sonic CD released in September of 93. Sonic Spinball released in November of 93. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine released two weeks after that. Why the hell would you do this? Sega was experiencing serious Sonic overload. If you had spare change and a good idea, you could buy the license to a Sonic game and do whatever the hell you wanted with it. But all of this was fluff, a bunch of nonsense to pass the time until the inevitable release of Sonic the Hedgehog 3. This game was going to be the biggest Sonic game to date. It was going to have more levels, an integrated story, the same things I said about Sonic CD, except this time it was going to be good. They were shooting to create the greatest game of all time. Unfortunately though, the hardware of the Genesis proved to be a problem. See, originally Sonic 3 was planned to be a 3D platformer, something Nintendo wasn't even close to attempting at the time. So they scaled this back to a large scale 2D platformer, but even then the problems didn't keep coming as business talks and financial problems plagued the path of Sonic 3 about halfway through development. The levels were becoming far too big, way too ambitious for the Genesis 16-bit hardware to handle. This was turning into a game that was almost bigger than Sonic 1, 2, and CD combined. Add alongside this an advertisement deal with McDonald's slated for one year out, there was absolutely no possible way that Sega could create the game that they wanted to in the time that was allowed. Son of a bitch! Thus, Sega decided to split the game in two. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 released on February 2nd, 1994, and Sonic and Knuckles, an add-on that could bundle up to Sonic 3 released on October 18th, 1994. Each game could be played individually without any problems between the two, but together, this was the biggest Sonic game to date, and one of the biggest, if not the biggest game on the Genesis by far. No, I've beaten Sonic 3 once before. It was on Sonic Mega Collection on the GameCube probably about 10 years or so ago, but that is going to change today because I am finally going to end my 2D journey of all of the Sonic games. My therapist is going to be so excited. Okay, so I have some questions. Why does this title screen start off with a 3D model of Sonic? I mean, I understand why they did that with Sonic CD. They wanted to show off how the CD can handle 3D graphics, but I don't like this. It doesn't help that Sonic takes up 90% of the screen. I mean, come on, the trademark logo is almost bigger than the main option. This is the game where Knuckles was introduced. Why not incorporate him at the start? 
uh, spoiler alert, this is the game where Knuckles was introduced. Apologize to anybody who wasn't going to wait 60 more seconds. Anyways. Right after the title screen, we get a brand new feature in the series, the save feature. I didn't find it absolutely necessary in Sonic 1 based off of how short it was, but in Sonic 2, this was definitely a needed feature, especially with this stupid final bo- I mean, Sonic 3 is a massive game, so this is an absolute breath of fresh air. Plus, it's kind of a long time coming, seeing as if Nintendo had games that included the save feature, uh, hmm, I don't know, maybe, um, a decade ago? Now I will be playing the Sega Collections version of this, primarily because this is where I'd hold my Genesis controller if I had one. Where the f**k's my Genesis? We start off with a cutscene. This game takes place directly after the events of Sonic 2. This is stated in the instruction manual. Evil Dr. Robotnik has invented a machine that turns good folks into rotten robots. This is an advert for Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bee Machine. Dr. Robotnik managed to crash land on the floating island. After learning that the island is able to float in the sky by harnessing the power of the emeralds, the doc decides to steal the emeralds so he can repair the Death Egg ship. Okay, that's great and all, but how the hell is he gonna steal the emeralds? Last time that we saw Sonic, he was in Super Sonic form, so there's no way that he can possibly Possibly. Meet Knuckles the Echidna. Apparently he likes discovering hidden passageways and grapes. Yo, what up? My name is Knuckles. I'm 15. I'm looking for somebody to love and I'm wearing a flannel because that's what all guys wear on a first date. Fun fact about me, I'm an Echidna, so that means I've got four heads on my d No, seriously, look it up. Echidnas have four heads on their this would be the first time we're introduced to Knuckles in the series. Apparently, he's been tricked by Eggman into believing we're the bad guys. This is merely two minutes before Eggman burns the entirety of Angel Island to the ground. Jumping into the gameplay, this is one of the prettiest 16-bit games I have ever played. The level design, the art style, is a much-needed break from Sonic CD. The title screen still looks like ass, though. This is a beautiful reminder of why so many people love the Genesis era Sonic. You have this lush, rich environment full of personality. This isn't just Angel Island Zone or Carnival Night Zone. These are actual locations in the Sonic universe. For the first time in the series, you feel like you're journeying through a place with a backstory. Playing through a Sonic game is supposed to be fast-paced, rewarding, and full of personality, and Sonic 3 manages to knock all of this out of the park. While Sonic 2 added many more branching pathways as compared to the fairly linear structure of Sonic 1, Sonic 3 just says, you know your copy of Sonic 2? F*** it, you have two more, go fall off a bridge or something. There is so much more to explore here, and while Sonic 2 did have a good incentive for exploration, every single nook and cranny in Sonic 3 has something to keep you going. There's a far more abundance of rings scattered throughout, there's a new and interesting mechanic in every single level, and the bonus stages- oh my god. The bonus stages are finally good in a Sonic game! That's right, no more getting 50 rings and praying you don't lose everything before a checkpoint. In Sonic 3, if you explore the world, you will be rewarded. Sonic 1, bad case of motion sickness. Sonic 2, I do like this one, just not at higher difficulties. Sonic CD, no? Here you have a 3D sphere in which you have to collect smaller spheres that are blue and reward you with a Chaos Emerald. It starts out simple enough, however as you gather more and more blue spheres, the level starts to get faster, the pinpoint timing gets tighter and tighter, the motion sickness draws nearer and nearer, but it never really comes. I like how if you encircle a group of blue spheres, the spheres turn into rings, and collecting 50 nets you continue much like Sonic 1. This is actually a whole lot of fun, and it's hands down miles better than any of the special stages we've had so far. Also, apparently this planet toy layout was inspired by King Kai's planet from the Dragon Ball manga. I just think that's pretty neat. That's not the only inspiration from pop culture though, as I'm sure we've all heard about Michael Jackson's inclusion in the soundtrack. Media scandals pulled out at the last minute. There's like a hundred videos or so on the topic. I'm not here to repeat what's already been said. However, I will say that Brad Buxer, Michael Jackson's composer for over 20 years, is still listed as the primary composer for the title. I mean, I get that Sega wanted to cover it up, but I guess this will remain one of gaming's biggest mysteries. The soundtrack is absolutely fantastic. I mean, what else do I have to say? It's a Sonic game. Much like Sonic CD, each stage has two acts, with each of its corresponding music tracks based off of the levels themselves. This is also the first game that John Cena was contributing to the series, who would go on to be one of the primary composers for almost every Sonic game after this. The music really helps sell the personality of the game, but can we talk about how Sonic is animated here? I've always been impressed by how Sonic is portrayed within his environment, but Sonic 3 just takes the personality and turns it right up to 11. Like, look at these idle animations. What are you waiting for? Get on with the game, you fat f as far as this moveset goes, not much has really changed here. The super peel out is gone, I can't imagine why. I said plenty of nice things about it such as... But now we have the Insta Shield, giving you a few frames of invincibility and a slight hitbox increase whenever you attack. A lot of people 
don't say this is fine, but I actually really appreciate this here. It's very unnecessary to beat the game, but if you know how to utilize it properly, it can really come in handy. Now, we did get new moves in the form of shields, the fire shield, bubble shield, and, uh... Uh, that one. The fire shield is pretty self-explanatory, makes you impervious to fire, but gives you a nice little forward dash in midair. The bubble shield makes Sonic impervious in the water, let me repeat that, makes Sonic impervious in the water, but can also be used to bounce on land and get to even higher places. The lightning shield is my favorite, it draws rings towards you when they're nearby, but even better allows you to get a double jump, which can be a lifesaver in tight-knit situations. All of these can be used in conjunction with enemies and hazards, I mean, they are shields after all. But now, we get to talk about the levels. I'm basically gonna do what I've done with every Sonic game so far. I'm gonna look at each individual level and give my thoughts on them. We always start with some sort of Green Hill-esque zone, so let's see what we're working with today. Angel Island Zone, one of the long-standing staples of the Sonic series that would continue to be seen in the future entries. I always thought the whole setting of the game was considered Angel Island, but no, in the original release, they actually call the whole island's floating island, and it is a joy to go through. It's a lot more jungle-oriented and a lot larger than the stages in Sonic 1 and 2, but Sonic has never felt better in the series. At the end of the first act, you encounter this machine that burns Angel Island to the ground. Please see my previous comment. But no, that's not actually the end of the level. It's only halfway through. These two parts of the level are completely different from one another and really make this feel like Sonic's first true adventure. Every zone has two acts that do this. The first act usually has some sort of story element that affects the second. Probably took some inspiration from Sonic CD with how Dr. Robotnik affects the layout of the level, except this time it's far more noticeable and good. The level ends with Knuckles dropping you straight into Hydrocity Zone. It wouldn't be somebody talking about Sonic 3 if they didn't mention the seamless level transitions. No, seriously, it says it right here in the script. Uh, part 8, talk about the seamless level transitions. Hydro City Zone, or Hydro City Zone, whichever floats your boat, is the only water stage in the game, which is actually kind of disappointing since it is one of the best levels here. It's really well paced, I never found myself running out of oxygen at the worst time, rest in peace tales, and it has plenty of interesting obstacles and mechanics like the conveyor belts and half pipes that remind me of Chemical Plant Zone. This is one of the best water levels in gaming, and the final boss is just the cherry on top. It's your typical hit Robotnik at the right time, but these mines can propel you higher if you time your jump on top of them, which is a really nice attention to detail to have. Especially in a Sonic game. Marble Garden Zone is an interesting one. No, not that Marble Zone. It's essentially an ancient ruined city, and personally, I think this is one of the prettiest levels in the game. How in the hell do they fit all these places on a one island? It can be a bit aggravating, though. These spikes are a real pain in the ass, and I think I'm gonna lose it if I have to hear the earth shaking out of my speakers like... <laughs> These boss fights though, man, they just keep switching it up around every corner. There's only so much you can do with one form of attack, but this flying sequence with Tails really feels great. I always felt Tails is almost forgotten in these classic titles, so it's nice to see him taking on a more active role. Carnival Night Zone is up next. hate this song. I've never really been big into the pinball carnival type levels in Sonic games. I feel that once you've seen one, you've pretty much kind of seen them all. There's not too much different here, but it does change up in the second act of the level, becoming far more mechanical like Dr. Robotnik is succeeding in his takeover. These moving platforms are an aggravating mess too. Every time I replay this game, I forget that you don't actually have to jump on these. You can just move up and down. The level isn't bad by any means. It's just one of those not my thing kind of deals. However, the coolest part of the level is honestly the end because I mean, just look at this transition into the next zone. Like, come on, you cannot tell me that's not the coolest transition in the game. I still have no idea what's going on with the geography, though. Ice levels are always really cool in video games. This is more of a puzzle-based level, which is fine. I know I've bitched about puzzle-based levels in Sonic games in the past, but as long as the puzzles break the monotony of the fast-paced gameplay and don't hinder on for too long, they can work really well in Sonic games. I did get stuck at this one part at the end though. I won't tell anybody about that though. The level transitions between going above ground and below ground and any other game at this time would try to pass these off as two separate levels, but no, this just really goes to show you the scope of how big they wanted these original games to be. Finally, we have Launch Base Zone. 
Yeah, I don't remember this level at all. I don't know how I feel about this one. I love the complimentary colors, because, you know, that's what's important to gameplay. But I don't really understand the Middle Eastern architecture. Part of this is a forest and a lake, but it looks like a desert. The level is fun to play, though. This zone actually has a two-part boss, the final in Sonic the Hedgehog 3. The first phase involves evading these cannonballs and hitting Dr. Robotnik, and then Knuckles does this for some reason. We get to hear before we get to the beam rocket and the big arm, the two-phase final boss fight of the game. And then the death egg falls, and it's kind of underwhelming. It is a really good build-up. The game does a great job at building upon the levels before it, but it kind of just abruptly ends? I mean, Sonic 2 has us boarding the egg carrier and going into space for a three-part boss fight. But Sonic 3 just ends on this high note as if they left off half the game. You know, maybe there's still something left in the McDonald's bag. I've got to do this again, don't I? Damn it, hold on. Sonic and Knuckles, the final game in the Sonic trilogy, while also being a second part of the follow-up of the third game, which was a direct sequel to the second. Did you get all that? Sir, I told you, if you so like I stated, Sonic 3 had to be split into two parts, with Sonic & Knuckles being released on October 18th, 1994. Unlike most games at the time, this came in the form of not its own cartridge, but a physical expansion pack, able to hook up to Sonic 3 to play both games as one whole package. I mean, look at this, this is one of the first and only forms of physical DLC, just without the DL and its its own standalone game. If you only have Sonic & Knuckles, you can play this game completely independently from the first game, but together. This is the true 100% way to play Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. And now I know what you're thinking, you've got three copies of Sonic 1 and three copies of Sonic 2, so what happens when I put those games in there? What, do I get to play the game as Knuckles? And you would be right, Knuckles is completely playable, but only in Sonic 2 and 3. Sonic 3 allows you to play as Knuckles right from the get-go. He has access to places Sonic and Tails doesn't have access to, seeing as if this is about the sixth time I've shown off this instruction booklet. He also has different bosses. It wouldn't really make sense from a story perspective if Knuckles was being tricked by Dr. Robotnik while also fighting him and trying to burn Angel Island to the ground while filling it with robots. I mean, come on, the dude has the word robot in his name. Knuckles is an idiot, but no one person can be that stupid. Don't respond to that. Popping and Knuckles into Sonic 2 allows you to play the game as Knuckles as well, but it's easy to tell that these levels weren't made with Knuckles in mind. The game is damn near irritating at times, but it is nice to know that he is here. But by popping and Knuckles into Sonic 1, it takes you to this screen with Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Robotnik saying no way. But this also gives you access to the Blue Spheres minigame from Sonic 3. In reality, any attached cartridge from the Genesis era will decide which layout that you get, but by attaching the original Sonic the Hedgehog, you get access to every possible variation of the special stages. 134,217,728. I didn't even get all the Chaos Emeralds. But now we are actually onto all of the stages, so let's take a look at where we left at after Launch Base Zone. What the f is that? Mushroom Hill Zone, and may I ask, why? I get that this is the first zone, but it's kind of anticlimactic coming from Sonic 3. Essentially, it just feels like, hey, we beat Dr. Robotnik. Oops, never mind, he got back up again. Also, in the original game, Tails kind of just f***s off. Like, where are you going? We still have more levels to explore, Fox Boy. For a seventh level, Mushroom Hill is nothing to really gawk over, but as a first level, it's actually pretty good. There's a new pulley mechanic, and all of the different pathways available from the mushrooms you can jump off really makes this level stick out as being great, if not better than Angel Island Zone. Similar to Angel Island Zone, the level does end with a chase scene, and I'm kind of getting tired of these at this point. I get that Sonic is fast-paced, but I'd love to see them change it up a bit. The change in season, though, is a very nice aesthetic. I do, too, feel like I've been playing this game for an eternity at this point. Flying Battery Zone is up next, and... This right here is peak Sonic 3 in my eyes. The music, the high stakes, the aesthetic. It's the first level that I genuinely found difficult while also truly being able to capture Sonic's fast-paced nature. Or at least it is at times. There are some moments that really feel like a nuisance. At times, this is the best Sonic has ever felt. But at others, the pacing just feels a little off. It's the most exhilarating thing, but it's also the most frustrating thing. It's like parenthood, except way harder. But it is genuinely amazing that they are still throwing new ideas and mechanics this far into Sonic 3. These high-speed boosters, mesh tubes, spinning propellers, seeing all new mechanics this late in the game where the entire mechanic is jump and dash, it is insanely impressive. The stage ends with a two-part boss fight, and this is the same boss from Sonic 2.
And then we're followed up with another chase scene like what? Sandopolis Zone, a fan favorite from the community. That means it's not. I mean, it's not that bad. It's Egypt inspired theme is really cool and perfectly makes sense why this is a more puzzle based level because of that. But it has another chase sequence and way too many puzzles to be tolerable. It's thankfully towards the end of the game, but for those who just played Sonic and Knuckles, this is usually the part where I stop during my normal playthroughs. Also, unpopular opinion, I actually like the first mid-stage boss. It's a gimmick boss, it makes you think outside the box, and it's one of the only gimmick bosses in the entire game, so I'll give props to it. Lava Reef Zone is up next, and it is brimming with life and personality. You can tell the developers really wanted to show off, since most fire levels around this time just involved lava, 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 lava. It does go on far too long, though. This is the longest level in the game, and surprisingly the last level with bonus stages. So if you didn't get all the emeralds by this point... Damn it! Hidden Palace Zone, a level solely dedicated to story elements in the Chaos Emeralds. You know, that's very fitting. The stage is essentially just here as a neat transition between Lava Reef Zone and Sky Sanctuary Zone. But if you've gotten all of the Chaos Emeralds in the game, you can enter the special stage and unlock the Super Emeralds, which transform Super Sonic into Hyper Sonic, the most powerful version of Sonic to ever exist. Unless you count the comics where he destroyed a black hole, but you know what? That's not why we're here. Hypersonic is neat, but I feel like it's fairly unnecessary. I'm much happier seeing Hyper Knuckles and Super Tails. But I didn't get all the Chaos Emeralds. Go ahead, tell my mom. I dare you. Sky Sanctuary Zone is up next. It's a sanctuary located in the sky. Oh my god, I wonder what it looks like. It's a single act level as well. It's not a chase zone, but you are chasing to catch up to Dr. Robotnik who is taken to the sky in the Death Egg. It's got some neat mechanics such as this completely original idea for a boss and this completely original idea for a boss. Nah, I really like this taking Sonic back to its roots. It's a nice little callback to the original game and it's a nice build up to Mecha Sonic at the end of the level. The level ends with Sonic and Tails boarding the Death Egg Zone, the final level in the game, and I don't have much to say about this one. I mean, what else is there to say? The game feels great, the game is still adding new mechanics this late in, it really makes you feel like you're playing a Sonic. The background always reminded me of the infamous Luke and Vader scene from Star Wars Episode V, and it adds an ominous feel to the final level, and I love it. And to add even more than that, this really adds a cherry on top to the final boss. This is what Sonic 3 feels like, a true adventure, a full-scale story of taking down a deranged egghead, saving the world, and riding the tornado, off into the sunset. And that was Sonic 3 and Knuckles, the last 2D mainline platformer for the Sega Genesis. Unless you got all the Chaos Emeralds. If you manage to get all the Chaos Emeralds, you can fight the final, final boss, the first true secret boss in the entire series. And it is the cherry on top to the cherry on top. Sure, it might be more of a cinematic cutscene, it's almost impossible to actually lose, but it really makes this game feel like the game Sega wanted to make in the beginning, the game where they were touting to be the greatest game of all time or at least one that's really, really good. And it is very good. Sonic 3 and Knuckles is a fantastic experience from beginning to end. This is originally the way that the game is supposed to be played. Its highs are very high and its lows are nowhere near as close to the rest of the series. But with that being said, it's time to rate the entire series as of right now. Coming in fifth place was Sonic CD. While I did appreciate this game, it did take me a while to get into because I really wanted to understand what the developers' intentions were with this game. And even though I understand more of what the developers were trying to go for, that doesn't really make it well executed. It's an okay game at best. I mean, it, it's tolerable. I still don't know what the f metallic madness is. Sonic the Hedgehog 1, home to Green Hill Zone and one of the greatest opening levels of all time. The game completely goes downhill after that, but I've got to give them effort because they got their footing and they did a pretty decent job at it. Sonic and Knuckles comes in third, and while I do think that Sonic and Knuckles is more climactic and some of the levels are better than those in Sonic 3, the game kind of just feels empty. There's no tails and they took out the save feature that was introduced in Sonic 3 which is weird because that's what I complimented Sonic 3 on the most. Rounding out second place is actually Sonic 3. And while I do think that Sonic 3 is a much better game overall than Sonic 2, as soon as you get going in Sonic 3, it kind of just ends at the sixth level, which is really disappointing. And I understand why they did it, but it just leaves this game just short of being better than Sonic 2. So, Sonic 2. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 took everything that Sonic 1 was lacking and put an unbelievable level of polish on it. And even though Sonic 3 is much better in its regards, this right here is the greatest standalone game on the Sega Genesis in my opinion. 
But if you want the best experience for the Sega Genesis, you have to go with Sonic 3 and Knuckles because no game can top this one. It is by far the pinnacle of 2D Sonic. Playing both games together, albeit a little long, is truly one of the highlights of the Sonic series. And I would even go as far as to say one of the best gaming experiences of all time. It has such a good level of polish. The visuals and audio design is an artistic vision, which at the time is one of the greatest we had ever seen in a video game to date. The levels, the music, the atmosphere, the story. This was truly the best experience that the Genesis had to offer. Unfortunately though, due to the sonic overload I was talking about before, this game didn't do as well as Sega anticipated. It only sold 4 million units together, which still makes it one of the highest selling games on the system. System, but this was Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles combined, and it didn't even sell as much as Aladdin. The game is one of the most sought after on the console, but thankfully due to Sonic Mega Collection and Steam, the game still lives on for people to play today. Okay, maybe not so much Sonic Mega Collection, but Steam, definitely a plus. It is unfortunate though, as without modding, there's no true way to play Sonic and Knuckles as a standalone game without emulation on a current gen console. Due to licensing issues between a million different parties, I don't think anybody has truly found out why this game is so hard to port to new consoles. The game is yet to get the typical Christian Whitehead remaster, or even be released in collection form on modern platforms, but thankfully we still have the full game available to download, and I guess if nothing else, that in itself is pretty neat. Well, I did it. I have beaten every original Sonic mainline game for the original Sega Genesis, and I don't ever have to talk about it ever again! I may have bitched, I may have over-exaggerated, I may have suffered from alcohol poisoning, but I have done it! I have completed my Sonic trilogy! Now all I have to do is Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic- Coming in at fifth place is Sonic CD. Coming in at fifth. Oh my goodness, get out of my throat. Oh.